anyway, uh, again, thank you uh, and, and welcome to the Foreign Correspondence Club. Uh, my name is uh, James Sims. I'm a contributor to Forbes and a member of PAC. Um, and I probably don't need to introduce our, our guest today. Um, but today, um, uh, Mr. Katsuya uh, Okada, uh, he's the uh, president of the uh, Democratic Party of Japan. Um, he's going to be talking about uh, J Japanese national security policy and uh, diplomacy, um, including the uh, changes that uh, the administration of Prime Minister Abe is uh, pushing forward on issues such as collective defense and also the Constitution. Um, and I believe today he's going to be focusing on uh, uh, Japan and uh, China relations, including the uh, Asian, uh, the new Asian Infrastructure uh, Development Bank. Um, and so without uh, any further ado, um, I would like to uh, introduce our guest today, uh, Mr. Uh, Katsuya Okada of the uh, uh, DPJ. And also, before I forget, our interpreter today is uh, Ms. Takamatsu. Thank you. So thank you very much for this opportunity to speak before you today. Um, with, I only have a limited amount of time to talk, so I thought I would focus on two points, as the MC has just mentioned. I'd like to talk a little bit about um, uh, the events leading up to the establishment of the AIIB, and uh, from uh, my point of view, uh, what I can see about uh, the relations that Japan has with other countries as a result of these developments, of the negotiations that have taken place. And secondly, about Prime Minister Abe's administration and uh, the uh, uh, topics that he is trying to push forward in terms of security legislation. I'd like to begin by speaking about the AIIB. Uh, when I first heard that uh, many European countries, beginning with the United Kingdom, had expressed a desire to participate in the establishment of this bank, when I first heard this news, I was very surprised. Uh, in regard to the AIB, uh, of course, uh, many things have been um, discussed about uh, the uh, new Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Uh, there are some problems that we can see about, for example, perhaps the um, less than um, st strict enough uh, standards that would be used for uh, uh, offering financing uh, to different organizations. Also, the fact that there might not be some kind of a permanent um, a board. Uh, there are many th different things that have to be worked out. However, what I was most surprised by in regard to this news was the fact that the members of the G could not come together and make a united decision or concerted effort regarding the AIIB. I think as a result, I can say that uh, in regard to the establishment of the AU, uh, AIIB, the United States and Japan uh, has, have made a diplomatic blunder, a very, very large diplomatic mistake. I think the establishment of this bank uh, is uh, symptomatic of the uh, declining power of the United States. <laughs> I think there are also some problems with Japan, uh, and one of the problems that I see uh, in regard to this AIIB issue is the fact that uh, in terms of uh, diplomacy, in terms of Japan's relationship with other nations, there are two ministries, two very powerful ministries uh, that are not necessarily working in great harmony or collaborating uh, well together uh, in the realm of uh, currency affairs in regard to international finances. Uh, it is the Ministry of Foreign Affairs that has a very, very strong uh, say in things. But in other uh, areas of diplomacy, it is the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, that basically take uh, leadership. And I think, in other words, you have a two-pronged or parallel uh, kind of diplomacy going on, and they were not able to harmonize and come together on this issue. You no problem with uh, the question of uh, how much did the uh, Kante or the Prime Minister's official residence um, take part in this issue, how much concern or interest did they take in this issue, and how much leadership did they give towards uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Ministry of Finance? Of course, when we come to uh, European nations, I mean, there are things that one can say about uh, the decisions that they made. Um, I think that this is an, a very explicit example uh, where business decisions came um, or first before any other considerations. Uh, I think uh, all of these matters um, uh, show that there are some fundamental deep issues underlying this entire topic. In other words, uh, I think the underlying issue is that we have this huge nation, uh, China, which has suddenly uh, developed great strength and power uh, and influence in the world. Uh, it is, as you know, uh, uh, not a democratic uh, nation. Uh, it has worked using different rules from the nations uh, of uh, the rest of the world. Uh, however, uh, it is now trying to uh, enter the international stage and uh, basically enter a world of different rules. Uh, because this is such a huge development that affects the entire world, it would have been best if the advanced nations of the world could have come together and taken a unified approach toward dealing with this topic. However, uh, especially among the European nations, they put their economies first. Uh, they kind of distorted or twisted the issue and made it simply an economic matter.
And when I look at the uh, U.S. and Japanese response, I think the, there are problems there as well. I think that uh, fundamentally uh, the two countries were uh, late coming to the table in regard to this issue. And I think the reason for their uh, lateness in their um, response was that subconsciously, perhaps, uh, these two nations did not want to truly accept or recognize the fact that China has suddenly become a tremendous power in the world. Uh, of course, I don't just want to look at the past, I want to look at the future. What can uh, Japan do in regard to this issue going forward? Um, I think one of the options uh, that uh, Japan has before it uh, is uh, certainly uh, the deadline is passed so that it cannot become one of the charter members of uh, this uh, new bank. However, uh, by uh, the end of uh, June, the um, articles of agreement uh, are going to be uh, finalized. If Japan can still have a say in how those articles will be drawn up or what the contents might be, uh, then I think there is one of the choices that Japan could uh, take is to join in, uh, even if it is not a charter member. You, uh, Having said this, however, um, I believe that uh, one of the prerequisites for Japan uh, joining uh, the AIB is to uh, ensure that all the members of the G7 uh, basically take a united uh, approach toward this issue. Uh, in other words, uh, Japan should try to convince uh, the other members of the G7 to take part uh, in the AIB. But uh, if, for some reason, uh, Japan's uh, requests or, or um, recommendations are not accepted, then against uh, the, uh, there is still the possibility for Japan not to take part uh, in uh, the AIB if they cannot get the cooperation of, of the full members of the G7. In any event, um, the AIB, of course, is something that's very, very much in the news right now. But I think, uh, I think similar uh, uh, topics will arise in the future. Uh, and I think what is important uh, is that in the future, when similar events arise, that the members of the G7 come together and work in a united way, in a concerted uh, uh, way. Uh, if uh, the G7 uh, basically moves uh, separately from the members of the G7 move separately from each other, then the uh, post-war rules of the world, of the international community, that have been established by democratic nations for the past 70 years will not be able to be maintained. Um, so I believe very much that the G7 nations should work uh, together. On the other hand, I think it is also very, very important to recognize, acknowledge, and understand that not only China but other emerging nations have gained power or are going to gain power in the world. In other words, there's going to be need for compromise uh, uh, among the nations of the world in the future, and we should all work together to try to create the best compromises possible. The next topic uh, is about uh, the uh, security legislation that uh, Prime Minister Abe's administration is trying to promote. I think the first thing uh, that I would like to uh, emphasize is that it is terribly important for everyone to understand that uh, what Prime Minister Abe is trying to do right now with security legislation is, try to bring, is trying to realize a dramatic shift, a radical shift in uh, the security legislation that Japan has held for the, in the post-war years. Okay. You, well. In other words, um, as you all know, Article 9 of the uh, Japanese post-war constitution uh, has made it very clear, and uh, we have always taken the policy based on Article 9 that uh, Japanese uh, forces uh, are not allowed to use force uh, overseas, in, in other words, outside of Japan. Uh, the only time that they are able to use force is if they are directly attacked. In other words, uh, they can return uh, fire, yeah, but it has to be basically individual self-defense. They are not allowed uh, to do take part in collective uh, self-defense. and what. Prime Minister Abe is trying to do now is to create exceptions uh, to this post-war understanding. Uh, one thing that uh, he is trying to implement is that uh, he's trying to uh, allow for the uh, exercise of a limited amount of collective self-defense. Prime Minister explains his understanding in this way. Uh, he says that uh, even if our nation is not under direct armed attack, uh, if uh, there is a situation uh, that is so serious and grave and has such potential consequences to damage or hurt to the Japanese people as though uh, Japan were under a direct attack, uh, then only under those circumstances can uh, Japan exercise the right of collective self-defense. Having said this, however, uh, during uh, the deliberations in the Diet, uh, during uh, question and answer sessions, he also said that uh, when given the example of um, mines uh, basically blocking uh, entrance or uh, exit from the uh, Persian uh, Gulf, uh, he said that depending on the circumstances, it would be possible that Japan's uh, self-defense forces would be engaged in mine sweeping operations. In other words, that would be an example of exercising force. 
In other words, what I am trying to explain is that although uh, Prime Minister Abe insists that it would be a very, very limited uh, uh, use of collective self-defense, there would have to be certain very restrictive conditions un uh, under which that uh, uh, collective self-defense right would be exercised, uh, we are very anxious that eventually that interpretation could increase and that more and more force could be used. Another area that uh, causes us concern is uh, the idea of kohoshien, which is translated as rear or uh, support or logistical support. Uh, I'm sorry to uh, become rather complicated in my explanations, uh, but I think many of you have the background to understand this. Uh, what is being discussed here uh, in regard to logistical support is that there are two different cases uh, where logistical support uh, comes into play. One is when uh, that kind of logistical support is necessary in order to secure peace and safety in the world. And the other time uh, is the other case is when uh, it is necessary to ensure uh, when there is a serious or grave uh, danger for Japan. Uh, in other words, uh, there are many laws, uh, several laws uh, on the books, and uh, depending on the particular case, uh, there are different laws that apply, and uh, there are different prerequisites as to which law can apply to which kinds of cases. Uh, in spite of the fact that there are many prerequisites and many uh, different laws, uh, the point uh, that is common to all of these uh, different uh, examples and cases and, and precedents is that the scope of the uh, logistical support has always been quite limited. Uh, in other words, there has always been a very clear line drawn between the areas where uh, that kind of logistical support can be um, offered uh, to uh, others. Uh, and it has always been that uh, there's been a line drawn between areas where there is combat taking place and places that are absolutely places that are very much free of actual armed uh, combat. Uh, however, uh, as we listen to uh, what Prime Minister Abe is trying to promote, we see that uh, he takes a very literal approach and says, if there is an area where there is no combat taking place at the moment, then uh, logistical support uh, can uh, be um, provided. In other words, uh, what he is saying, uh, what is he is trying to achieve is to bring the logistical support very close, much closer to the battlefield than ever before. Of course, I understand that Japan's way of thinking about these matters might differ from what might be considered common sense by the rest of the nations, or most of the nations of the world. In other words, it may be that other countries believe that uh, every country should make some kind of a contribution uh, to uh, uh, these uh, conflicts, uh, including uh, the possibility of using uh, armed force as well. However, as you know, Japan has been a very, very unusual case uh, in the post four years. Japan has been very much clinging to this uh, tenet or a belief that we do not allow uh, the use of force uh, overseas. And uh, I think as a result of our having kept to this position, we have from many people in the world uh, received recognition uh, for our policies uh, the truth of that a fact, uh, the truth of the matter is that in the post-war years, there has not been one case of a self-defense force person killing another person uh, somewhere else and there are many countries that regard this matter quite highly in other words, uh, we do have uh, this uh, very uh, important restriction that is uh, artic within Article 9 of the Constitution uh, there is also another problem in that uh, the people of the nation have not really fully understood this matter, and yet things are proceeding very, very quickly without uh, their full and complete understanding or acceptance of these uh, changes that are being implemented. And I believe that if things are done too fast, uh, too hastily, then eventually uh, many serious problems will arise. I believe that when you implement uh, drastic or very large changes in society, I think you must proceed step by step carefully, uh, getting the understanding and the approval and acceptance of the people each step along the way. So as you know, uh, in May we will begin uh, deliberations in the Diet uh, on these matters and uh, the DBJ intends to uh, take full and serious um, part in these uh, discussions and deliberations. Thank you for your kind attention. Uh, thank you. Uh, we'd like to go to questions uh, from the working press. Um, if you could please state your name and affiliation and keep it to uh, one question. If we have more time we can go around to a second round. Um, and also, if I, I forgot to mention, if you have your phones, if you put them on uh, Manor or turn them off. Anyway, uh, so it's open to questions from the working press. Anthony? Anthony Rowley, Singapore Business Times. Um, um, it's obvious from recent elections, both national and local, that Minchito has not exactly set people's imagination on fire in this country. A large amount of abstentions at the, at the, the polls. Um, what issues do you think you can push which will differentiate you more effectively from the 
LDP and uh, make, give you a greater voter appeal. Can you name some of those issues? You've, you've spoken today a little bit about security, but how can you appeal more directly to the voting public, do you think? I'd like to begin by saying that um, I understand, of course, and as I'm sure you do, that uh, the current state of the DPJ is that we do have still some uh, outstanding issues that we're still trying to work on resolving. And um, it might be possible to uh, work them out over a short period of time, uh, but I think that, I, I don't think it's impossible to work things out in, or in a short period of time, but I think there are some fundamental issues that we still need to revolve, resolve, and that will take a little bit of time, but I think it is worth spending that time. Uh, one thing that I can say is that uh, perhaps over the past two years, the uh, policies of the uh, DPJ, the things uh, that, they, that we stand for, have become uh, rather ambiguous. I mean, the messages that we're sending out are not uh, as clear as they should be. And what I think, therefore, is important is to send out very clear messages of uh, what the DPJ's policies are. Uh, uh, Linda? Linda Stig from Reuters. Uh, I'd like to ask you, uh, the Prime Minister will be going to Jakarta on Wednesday and be giving a, a short remarks that are gaining a lot of uh, interest, well, people are interested to know what he will say there about uh, the wartime history issue. Uh, similarly, he'll be giving a speech in Washington next week. And then, of course, uh, we're all looking forward to the uh, Abe Damwa in August. So I wonder if you could say what you think uh, the Prime Minister's message concerning uh, the wartime past should be both to Asia, to the United States, and to the world. Uh, if I start on this topic, I'll take a very, very long time. Uh, but I think the first thing I would like to say is that uh, fundamentally, this message should be a message that is directed the Jap to the Japanese people. Well, in regard to uh, the matters of the past, um, I'm not. There's have been many, many things that have already been said, and I've made similar comments about uh, these matters uh, in the diet. So I'm not going to take your time up here and repeat them. I think uh, Prime Minister Abe should be very, very careful uh, to uh, ensure that he does not give the impression that uh, the Japanese understanding of the past has not uh, moved backwards. Uh, I'm sorry. I hope the interpreter did not uh, make um, make. Uh, that unclear. I know Prime Minister Abe should not uh, speak in a way so that uh, people think uh, that uh, Japan's understanding of the past has moved, has regressed or moved backwards. Um, and I think pri primarily uh, Prime Minister to uh, Abe will talk about uh, the future and I think his uh, fundamental topic will be what he calls uh, proactive pacifism or, or proactive uh, contribution to peace. Yeah. To you. And I think what is important to understand is that uh, when he talks about this proactive contribution to peace or proactive pacifism, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, when he talks about these kinds of concepts, what he means by this, what is included in this meaning is that uh, Japan, he believes that Japan should uh, change uh, from its post-war policies of the past. In other words, in the past, it has always stuck to this policy of never taking part of use exercising force overseas. but. In his definition of proactive pacifism, he wants to include the possibility of using force abroad. When we consider, uh, as I mentioned earlier, that uh, many countries and many persons throughout the world have uh, regarded Japan highly because uh, Japan is not engaged in uh, the use of force overseas for the past 70 years, if uh, Japan has been regarded highly uh, for this reason, then uh, the fact that Prime Minister Abe is basically going to try to change uh, this policy, uh, how his remarks will be interpreted, I think uh, opinions will split into two in the world. Some will rate him highly, some will not. Um, I think that uh, still there's not been uh, uh, generally a deep understanding of necessarily what uh, Prime Minister Abe uh, is uh, doing, uh, but I think that there will be many, many different uh, reactions to whatever he says. Thank you, sir. A short question, Khaldun uh, Azhari, News. What are the negative uh, points or negative results, if any, for Japan not uh, joining that bank? What shall we expect, like that collapse of Japanese economy, for example, or whatever? Thank you. If we talk about the negative impact of Japan not joining the AIIB, uh, when we consider what this bank was, uh, is being established for, it is basically to provide investment money for uh, big infrastructure projects in Asia. At uh, present, uh, this kind of money comes from the Asian Development Bank and from the World Bank. Uh, if the AIIB is entering the same field, it means that obviously Japan's influence in this area will uh, diminish and perhaps disappear. 
Of course, as you know, uh, the Asian Development Bank uh, does uh, provide financing uh, to uh, many different uh, projects in many different countries. However, uh, the standards, uh, the requirements for receiving that kind of financing are, are very, very severe. They have to go through a very, very a strict uh, process, vetting process. Uh, however, uh, it might be that the AIB, it is said that the AIB might uh, provide a looser uh, prerequisites or looser standards. It might be easier to get financing. In other words, also uh, particular uh, uh, countries may receive receive priority in receiving that kind of financing. Uh, if this kind of uh, financing becomes prevalent in this area, I think there will be more confusion in this area. Um, I just wanted to follow up on um, the issue of differentiation with the LDP uh, between the DPJ. Um, from what I understand, in the 12 gubernatorial elections, uh, that only two of the elections were fought between the ruling and the opposition party, and that 10 of them um, it was where the LDP and the DPJ supported the same uh, local candidate. So if you're both supporting the same local candidate, how can you differentiate yourself? Um, I would like to point out uh, that it is not necessarily that uh, the DPJ and LDP are uh, promoting the same uh, uh, candidate, but uh, in uh, some cases, uh, it, there's the uh, case where the LDP basically begins to back a candidate that was originally a DPJ a candidate. Um, something that became very clear just uh, yesterday was that in my own electoral district, which is Mia Prefecture, uh, the uh, capital of uh, Mia Prefecture is a city named Su, and the mayoral election uh, there was fought four years ago between two candidates, one an LDP back candidate and one a DPJ back candidate. The DPJ back candidate won, and uh, that person is the current uh, mayor, and uh, this current uh, mayor was backed not only by the original DPJ, but also the LDP decided to back that person too. I uh, personally believe that uh, if a candidate uh, has gone through the election process and uh, that person has uh, basically done a good job, not caused any problems, and has uh, achieved some results uh, during that person's tenure in office, then uh, there is not necessarily a need to set up an opposition candidate just to set up an opposition candidate. Yeah. Of course, however, uh, if there is not an incumbent, uh, and or, or I'm sorry, or if there is an incumbent uh, who has created problems, uh, or if uh, the incumbent has decided to step down or for some reason uh, not decided to uh, run again, then uh, I think that if there's going to be a new uh, uh, mayor uh, put into place, then I think it is only natural that the number one party and the number two party, the opposition party, uh, should set up different candidates. So, Mayor, that includes governors, right? Mm. Okay. Um, I think there's a question back here. Yeah. Um, I'm a freelancer uh, Koyama. Uh, I'm a freelancer Koyama. I'm a freelancer Koyama. The Constitution is very, very clear uh, in regard to the use of uh, armed force or. Uh, the use of exercise of force, uh, it can only be used uh, in time in times of um, uh, self-defense. Uh, but uh, when we talk about uh, in order the, uh, the the case where one needs to defend oneself, uh, that concept uh, is very very different from that uh, self-defense concept in the in the West. Uh, what it means is that. Um, in general, if one thinks about uh, self-defense, one s senses that one is in mortal danger and can uh, use force. However, in the case of the uh, self-defense forces, uh, the restriction is very, very clear. Unless the other person fires first, you cannot uh, protect yourself. Uh, so in sp the fa it is, uh, this uh, restriction is very, very clear and in, in Article 9. So if, however, as you say, Prime Minister Abe is suggesting that uh, forces can be force can be used by these self defense forces overseas then isn't there a need to revise article 9 of the constitution my understanding of the Constitution is that there is no specific line uh, or wording in the Constitution that says that uh, the Japanese side person cannot uh, use a weapon first you however uh, article 9 of the Constitution can be read to understand that the use of force is prohibited Tada, as a result of uh, many, many uh, diet uh, deliberations, uh, it was uh, finally agreed upon that um, although the use of force is prohibited uh, by the Constitution, uh, that does not necessarily uh, mean that uh, the country can simply lie back and uh, completely be attacked and taken over and have the country destroyed. Uh, in other words, that uh, it does have the right to individually for just the nation uh, defend itself. In other words, the, the right to individual self-defense uh, has uh, been understood uh, to be a legal interpretation of the Constitution. So what Prime Minister Abe uh, is saying is that uh, 
he's giving us a, a possibility that uh, there might be a situation that arises where Japan itself is not under armed attack. However, there is some situation that arises uh, where uh, the grave and severe uh, consequences to the people of Japan are so dire that it could be considered to be equivalent to uh, Japan's coming under armed attack. In that case, uh, Japan would have the right to defend itself. However, because Japan at that point in time is not under direct attack, it would not be considered legally uh, individual self-defense, but would have to be put under the category of collective self-defense. That is his understanding, and that is his explanation. Whether that will gain a wider understanding is a different question. Um, I'm going to ask questions in Japanese. I'm Jimbo from Video News. Um, as you know, uh, a very recent uh, uh, big topic in the news is uh, the relationship between uh, politics and uh, the political world and the media, um, particularly the relationship between uh, uh, the government or politicians and uh, television or broadcasting stations. Uh, it is said uh, that uh, because uh, in Japan uh, the broadcast la law allows for the granting of uh, TV station licenses or broadcasting licenses by the government, uh, it is easier uh, for the government to put pressure on or to interfere uh, in uh, the workings of the uh, television stations. Uh, in order to correct this problem when the Democratic Party of Japan was in power, uh, the uh, Minister of Internal Communications, uh, Internal Affairs and Communications, Mr. Haraguchi, came to this place, the FCCJ, and said that he wanted to change the situation and create a more independent organization that would oversee the granting of licenses, something like a J Japanese version of the US FCC. Uh, and of course, I know that the DPJ is not uh, in uh, power at present, but do you, as an opposition party, have any intention, especially because there is so much focus on this issue of uh, government or political intervention in uh, television stations and their programming, uh, do you have any intention of presenting such an idea? Uh, of course, this was a topic that uh, was uh, discussed uh, some years ago, and I don't remember all of the details very carefully, but I believe that uh, in regard to this issue, um, our proposal had uh, many aspects, and one of the aspects was that we were proposing the idea of um, when the uh, TV frequency bans are allotted that we would have uh, some kind of a tender or bidding process. Uh, in regard to this bidding process idea or tender uh, idea, uh, there were many, many uh, opinions. Uh, and as a result, finally, uh, this was not realized. And of course, certainly, uh, although we presented this idea uh, as a result of all the discussions that followed, uh, we did, uh, I think, uh, come to realize that there were some um, negative aspects to having an uh, open bidding or tender uh, process. So I believe that this is something that we need to deliberate further within uh, the party uh, before coming to a final decision. You, um, I think, however, that I can say that until now, uh, successive administrations have, uh, in regard uh, to the media, taken a very, very cautious uh, and careful approach uh, to their dealings with the media. Uh, having said this, however, since uh, Prime Minister uh, Abe has come to power, this relationship or this uh, uh, attitude by uh, the government has changed, I believe, quite uh, drastically. A very, very clear example of this is the fact that before the past general election, uh, the uh, uh, organizations in power basically sent out uh, letters uh, to a major media asking that they do fair and neutral reporting of the elections. I don't know if uh, this uh, letter had uh, was the direct cause of this or not, but uh, certainly the uh, television coverage, uh, media coverage of the elections uh, in terms of volume was much smaller uh, than before. Um, I understand that the people in the media, um, I do not know what kind or if you do actually feel pressure, uh, but if you do, I hope that you will have the courage to please stand up and not bend to that kind of pressure. Also, when we look at uh, the uh, kind of personnel decisions that have been made uh, within NHK, uh, the uh, national broadcaster, uh, including uh, the selection of a pers particular person as chairman of NHK, uh, the kinds of personal decisions that are being made uh, during this uh, current administration uh, would have been unthinkable, I think, in the past. Uh, these are problems, we believe, and we have repeatedly brought these matters up in the diet, and we will continue to do so. Go ahead. Siegfried Needle, freelancer from Germany. You said uh, the DPJ needs to um, some time to develop a position about in the, how to deal with the media. I think this is not a general problem of the DPJ. Does the DPJ d discuss too much what to do, what kind of policy to develop? In this way, uh, 
do you not think it would be necessary to, to develop very fast a clear, clear alternative to the, to the uh, LDP to uh, have a chance to win in the next election? I would like to uh, mention that we have tried very, very hard uh, to uh, actually present ourselves as a viable alternative. We do have very different stances from the uh, ruling parties in terms of various uh, in, in various areas. For example, we have a very distinct energy policy. Uh, we have uh, different ideas about security legislation, as I have gone into some detail uh, today. And in terms of economic policies, we differ quite much, uh, quite a great deal from the uh, ruling parties. In other words, one of our great focuses is on resolving wealth disparity. That is one of our main themes. Uh, however, one of the problems we face, perhaps, and that we need to work harder to uh, correct, is that our messages are not necessarily getting out to the people that need to hear them. Just to follow up on the uh, issue of the government and the press, I mean, the meeting last week uh, where the uh, LDP called in uh, TVSI and NHK, uh, you were saying that if the media feels pressure that they should um, respond to it, but they don't seem to be responding to it. I mean, you, as um, the head of the opposition party, do you not feel that calling in broadcast networks is uh, whether by intent or not intent, it's adding pressure on them to uh, basically follow uh, government or party policies or not to criticize them? Uh, in regard to uh, NHK and TV Asahi, uh, in regard to uh, the reasons uh, why they were called to uh, the LDP, they had already made uh, public uh, their explanations about uh, these matters. So. Uh, the fact that in spite of this, uh, the LDP uh, subcommittee or committee uh, called them to their headquarters uh, is an action that uh, might uh, very well be taken as being uh, something that has a deliberative intent behind it. I don't think the LDP can, ex uh, can escape that kind of criticism, that it would be viewed in that way. Uh, in, especially in regard to the problem with uh, TV Asahi, uh, the problem uh, that occurred was, as you know, uh, because Mr. Koga came here uh, to the press club, uh, a commentator uh, on one of their programs uh, made uh, certain comments. However, a commentator is not a person who is actually working for TV Asahi. Uh, he's not a direct employee or anything, but he is a person who is an independent outsider. And so why the TV Asahi uh, person would have to go and basically explain it uh, is, uh, I think that, is, that, that um, idea is also problematic. Okay, go ahead. This will be the last question. Uh, thank you. Michael Penn of the Shingetsu News Agency. I want to follow up on a question that I think several of us have had and we still want to kind of get a clear answer on, which is that if you look at the opinion polls, actually the Abe government's policies on almost every individual issue, the public is against them. But the people keep voting for the LDP. And the reason most analysts think is because the opposition is not putting forward any credible alternative. And it's not, it's not showing that it can, can rule the country in a way that uh, the people can vote for. And in fact, uh, there seems to be a lack of excitement. So my question to you as the leader of the largest of the opposition parties is, how are you going to create excitement to raise the voter turnout and to create an alternative that the Japanese people will vote for and they'll get out of their house and they'll go to the voting booths and vote for your party? It's a very, very difficult question to answer. Uh, when we talk about making voters excited, uh, when we look at the past, we have seen uh, elections where voters have been excited. Uh, for example, uh, in 2005, uh, when uh, Prime Minister Koizumi presented the idea of postal privatization, he presented a beautiful, rosy picture of the world. If we just simply go through with postal privatization, uh, the world will improve. Uh, we, our di diplomatic uh, efforts, our diplomatic situation will improve. Our economy will improve. Everything will be wonderful. Now, I think, in retrospect, many people are thinking, why did we believe that? Why did we get so excited about that. And in 2009, we had a similar situation where people did, again, become very, very excited about a, a viable alternative, uh, and they pushed for uh, administrative change, in other words, a change of government. Uh, and at the time, many people believed, as they went to the polls, that this would be something that would drastically change their lives, drastically change Japan for the better. However, uh, as you know, um, some things change for the good, and but some things change not for the good. 
Two years ago, we had another election again, and uh, the idea there was the presentation of Abenomics, and Abenomics was presented as something that would basically c uh, cure many of Japan's uh, ills. Uh, it would j drastically uh, revive the economy. And certainly, we have seen some positive results in that um, some shares, uh, prices have gone up, but overall, I think uh, that Abenomics basically missed its mark. Uh, in spite of this, however, there's still some people, a member of the, uh, a part of the population that still clings to hope that Abenomics might change uh, their lives. So when we uh, consider the next uh, election, uh, I think uh, we have to think about what exactly approach, what a kind of approach we want to take. On the one hand, we could try to again uh, create excitement among uh, the um, population, uh, present very rosy pictures, in other words, present wonderful um, ideas and policies that have no real substance, but will create excitement and will create uh, great hopes among the population. Or we could take another approach, which is not something that will excite the voters, but will present to them uh, the truth of the matter. And present calm and rational choices for them to make. Which is the approach to take? Of course, um, I personally do not want to go uh, in, uh, in, into very, very um, extreme uh, directions uh, in either way, but I believe that it is important uh, to present to the public honestly uh, the situation that uh, Japan is finding itself. The fact is populations are decreasing. Uh, we are facing an economic fiscal crisis. And I think that uh, if we present policies that honestly don't present rosy pictures, but honestly presents uh, the truth and explains how we intend to deal uh, with uh, these uh, issues uh, without rosy, rosy results, but with good results. In other words, if we can present policies that are honest, but still give people hope, then I think that is the correct way to uh, proceed. Well, uh, thank you very much. We've actually run over time uh, just a bit. And as is our uh, usual custom, uh, we usually give an honorary membership uh, to um, our, our guest speakers. Um, but um, Mr. Okada has been here, I think, so many times that we can't give him a new one. We have to actually extend it, um, which is unlike uh, the LDP, which we haven't had any of their executives here for quite a while. Um, Anyway, again, thank you very much uh, for your uh, very frank and uh, open discussion. Hello. <laughs> I'd like some kind of a, a free meal uh, coupon. That would be very, very nice. Okay. <laughs> very good. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you um, and uh, as to before uh, you, you get up, um, we just need to allow uh, Mr. Okada to uh, get out and get on to his uh, next schedule. And so if you could please stay seated until then. Um, thank you very much. mama. お待ちいただければと思います。ご退場されるまで着席のままでお待ちいただきます。